pushing down the barrel, um, indigenous resistance. Um, I'd quickly like to introduce everyone. I'm Rebecca Raymond, I'm the curator, Elaine Sarang, the artist. We've got Uncle Ken Canning and we've got the wonderful Lorna Munro. Um, Uncle, before we go any further, Uncle Ken Canning will perform an acknowledgement. Thank you. Although the knowledge of the country, I can't welcome to this country because I'm not from here. My people are the Bidjoo people from South West Queensland. But I've lived here since 1979, but I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I think it's more important to acknowledge the land we stand on is still sacred, despite the tar and cement that we see. We're still on sacred land, we're still on land that was never ever ceded and I doubt will ever be seated. It's important to note that during such a, an exhibition of protest that we as Aboriginal people have never stopped fighting for our land. It's important to note that now in recent times people are starting to say we should have monuments up. We've been saying that for many, many, many years. What I'd like to see, see is our federal governments and our state governments and our education departments reflect what we see here today. We've been fighting against what happened in 1788, and that was a war was declared on Aboriginal peoples that spread right throughout the land. Our country is yet mature enough to acknowledge that it was warfare. And until they do, the warfare will still go on. I'm afraid it will still continue. We have to acknowledge that. Because, it, and this is not about anybody who's sitting here, you wouldn't be here if you um, did not see the point of view of our resistance. But we have to acknowledge that we are living in an environment where federal governments and state governments are still engaging in active warfare against Aboriginal peoples. It's good to see in this exhibition also to acknowledge all the brave people in this exhibition but it's also good to see that all the children were involved and that Elona's <coughs> personally showed to the children. This is generations of resistance are sitting right there. It's good to be here to have some fond memories. There's people on there who I won't mention their names, but they're since gone. But they fought the good fight. But I think we should acknowledge two things. Our sacred country still exists in every square centimetre of this country and our resistance is forever alive. Thank you. Thanks Uncle Ken for setting the context. Um, yeah, it's always um, overwhelming too to be sitting in, um, sitting in a room and talking about history when we've got people that were actually part of the history here. Um, my parents are Lyle and Jenny Munro. They were very much involved in um, the Black Power movement that hit this country, starting from um, you know Redfern and Waterloo. Um, they had moved here in the 70s from their respective missions, um, which were um, Maury and Cow. Um, and you know, missions were a very controlled environment. Um, that you know, my mum and dad's generation were probably the first to leave the missions and come to the cities for um, you know much more opportunities and um, to create a safe black space away from the racism that was experienced um, in the towns and things like that at the time and that are still happening today um, you know there's so much there's so many incidences that we can talk about that has really formed the the legacy of Aboriginal resistance that people like me have inherited today. Um, and I always you know, have to give, it, give an acknowledgement and acknowledge people like my mother and father that um, you know, dished up black politics and history like breakfast, lunch and dinner every single day. Um, and I have found myself in a position to be able to educate other people, my own peers in school, my own cousins, even um, you know, through the university environment and stuff like that. I'm now back at my local school, um, Alexandria Park Community School, um, facilitating a language and poetry writing project um, called Yalagari, which means speak the truth in Wiradjuri. Um, so you know, I didn't grow up with language. I didn't grow up being surrounded by culture and all 
all these sort of things. I had to find that for myself. I had to reclaim that. And that was, again, you know, very much because of the foundations that were laid by the previous generation. They politicised a lot of the things that they didn't have because they didn't want their young people blaming themselves for being cultureless, languageless and lost. So very much a part of my generation, we've really run with that and we've really immersed ourselves and are breathing life into things that have been called dead for some time now. You know, we don't like to even use that language, dead. We like to talk about, you know, breathing life into something that's been asleep for a very long time. And our old people have been waiting for, you know, us. They've been waiting for us to come through and keep pushing these boundaries that were pushed back then and before them and the people that influence them people and the people that influence them people. And that's why we talk about Aboriginal resistance as a legacy. It's not just history. It's a legacy that's been inherited. Um, so I think I've, I've done like heaps of notes over the last couple of like weeks um, just because being a little history geek, you know, you always want to have dates and stuff like that. But to tell you the truth, um, con white concepts of time are irrelevant in this story because something that happened 240 years ago is still very much playing out today which is why we have, you know, um, such visceral conversations that pop up every 26th of January, you know, whether this country was colonised or settled, um, whether it was invaded or settled, um, actually. Um, you know, everyone, there's a big campaign at the moment to change the date. Change the date is a redundant thing because we're still celebrating colonialism. So, you know, what's the point of changing it to another day to celebrate colonialism and genocide on another day? Um, yeah, no. Okay, so the genesis of Aboriginal resistance, as Uncle Ken has talked about, um, was birthed on the shores of Cornell in 1770 when two warriors contested the first landing party by order of Captain Cook, and they were shot at for their efforts. The weaponry left behind, as it was so carefully worded by the British Museum, is today the centre of a huge debate between the museum and descendants of these two warriors. The shield in question still to this day wears a hole the size and shape of a bullet, a musket bullet, at the time, but is deemed to have been the result of the, fire, of the firing as recorded in Cook's diaries. The people in the museum say it was a hole created by a spear. Um, <coughs> so when we talk about Aboriginal resist resistance, we start at the start and acknowledge that our people resisted, contested, challenged, invasion, genocide, and oppression, theft, and discrimination from the first interaction with white people. The legacy was, of resistance was inherited by warriors like Pemawai, who led a guerrilla campaign for 12, 12 years, driving the colony into starvation, confusion, and desperation. His son, Tedbury, fought by his side and led after Pemawai was murdered, decapitated, and sent to England as a gift. I believe it was sent to a man named Joseph Banks. Joseph Banks, which <coughs> you know, is also the name given to one of the social housing buildings in Redfern, Waterloo, which, you know, when I was growing up, had the highest population of Aboriginal people um, in any urban community. Um, I think there was... I think it has been said... Uh, there's been a quote by um, my cousin Johnny, uh, Danny Tease Johnson, and he did a story about the gentrification of Waterloo. And he talks about in 1968, some 35,000 Indigenous people lived in Redfern. By 2011, at the time of the last census, it was just 300. So, you know, um, those people were. Huh? What happened? Gentrification and ongoing dispossession of you know, Aboriginal people, and that's what we're going to go, go into. Now, this is all. This is the solution by government, you know, when talking about the Aboriginal problem, is to keep moving them, keep dispossessing them, keep silencing them, which is why it's so important for young Aboriginal people today to control the narrative. Because, you know, if we're not centred in everything and anything today, people are just continuing to silence us and oppress us. Um, so, I just find it interesting that... Um, some of the ho ha social housing projects in Redfern Waterloo that I've grown up in were named after Captain Cook, Joseph Banks, Daniel Solomon, um, and then the two buildings in the middle were named after the two islands that Captain Cook sailed past. 
Um, one was called Taranga and one was Matabai. Um, you know, and then there's a whole deal of cultural appropriation going on in there. There's a marae and stuff like that, little fountains and, you know, that are very Australian kitsch sort of 1950s style architecture, which is all very interesting when we look at it retrospectively today. Um, so, there's a lot to talk about. And as you may or may not tell, it gets really exhausting. Um, you know, it gets really challenging um, reliving the trauma that we talk about when we talk about genocide. Um, and we talk about how these policies have affected our, our, our people's lives. So I'm a Radford poet and an educator, if I fail to mention. Um, I went to UTS um, and graduated with a combined degree in adult education and community management. Uncle Ken was actually one of the um, deadly professors. Is that your official title? I, I think I was called the Academic and Cultural Advisor, but I don't know what I was. <laughs> well, you know, like I said with titles, we all get a bit caught up in white man's language sometimes, but Uncle Ken was a source of information and support there at UTS when I was there, and it was people like Uncle Ken that really pushed and, um, you know, kept kind of just reminding me that it was so important to have someone like me there in that institution at that time. Um, so when I talk about growing up, I talk about being a living, breathing, walking, talking product of the Black Power movement, being the embodiment of four generations of Aboriginal radicalism and growing up in the largest urban Aboriginal community of the time, which is now under a wave of gentrification, dispossessing another generation of already dispossessed peoples. Redfern, Sydney, the front line of Aboriginal resistance for over 240 years of invasion and genocide was my playground growing up. Um, uh, my, my mother's mother is featured um, in the picture here overlooking my mum um, talking. I've actually got a copy of that picture, it's one of my favourite pictures. Um, and one of the first times when I was pushed to get up and, and speak by my mum, um, you know, it was actually the, the pictures that were taken from that was at a writers' festival, um, and Uncle Lionel Fogarty had, had, had um, heard that I was writing poetry made space for me within the panel and um, you know got me to get up. I did my poetry and literally this picture that my mum is holding on the phone here um, has actually been replicated with her in the background looking at me. So I find these pictures all very um, symbolic of that connection and that ongoing legacy. Um, my, my mother's mother was named Isabel Wedge and during my mother's research to have the Day of Mourning site heritage listed, um, she had found out that my great-grandmother was actually a part of the Day of Mourning protest. So that makes us four generations officially of black activism. Um, you know, and it's probably going back a lot more. Um, so I've had the pleasure of having the best teachers growing up and being exposed to black liter literature from an early age and having positive reinforcement at home and in the community. I lived, I lived in as enabled me to be able to reiterate the history, um, I say the legacy of embodying ancient warrior bloodlines. So say for example, like um, I grew up in a house where my mum refused to buy me white dolls because she knew what kind of a negative impact that would have on young Aboriginal girls. Um, you know, so she did things like ordered dolls like that would have cost a lot of money back then, special edition cultural dolls that had Native American dress and African dress and all the indigenous sort of, you know, special edition little dolls at that time. Um, I only when I went to university I realised how important that was because when I was growing up, I noticed that I didn't fall into a lot of the toxicity that people my age fell into because I had people like my mum that was always just really reinforcing um, a decolonised methodology of thinking and being and reinforcing that positive black view of the world, which doesn't correlate with the white view that we've been forced to kind of have. You know, that's why um, Aboriginal children, you know, um, have poor literature and numeracy um, skills apparently, but a lot of the white teachers in the department does not consider the fact that Aboriginal children have only been exposed to English language and numbers and literacy for 200 years. So we've actually mastered that faster than any non-English speaking people in the world. But you know, our children are still getting blamed for 
past policies <coughs> and how that has affected our people. Um, so there is a huge campaign at the moment to have that shield come back. It was loaned by the British Museum, I think last year or the year before, that, that shield that was picked up in Cornell. And we actually visited that shield um, and it's quite a powerful energy. Um, it was the first time it had been back on country in over 240 years um, and the British Museum refused to leave it here or refused to engage with um, the descendants of the people, which very much sets the context for the rest of <coughs> Aboriginal and, and white interactions for the rest, like up until now. Um, so, then we talk about people like Pemawoy, and we talk about um, the campaign that he led, the 12 years of um, you know, the resistance war that he fought, with him being murdered in 1802 and his head being sent back to Joseph Banks. His son Tedbury continued the resistance for some years. It was said that he had continued for at least another nine years after his father died. In 1820, white men followed two black fellows over a mountain and called it blue. Winterdine of the Radri kept the invaders bound to Sydney Cove for a lot longer than what they were expecting. So, you know, when I talk about my involvement with Aboriginal resistance, we're always talking about people like Windradine and people like Pemaway, who knew the kind of damage that was going to be felt as a part of that colonialism. They, they knew what kind of heartbreak this generation would be feeling, and that is why they died fighting to keep white people in Sydney Cove, to keep them from invading further country. And then after that first push over the Blue Mountains by Blacksland, Wentworth, and what was the other white fellow's name? Wilson. That followed two. Wilson. That followed two black fellows over the mountain. Um, you know, we talk about these statues. We talk about these colonial statues and celebrations. Um, you know, where are, where are the statues for our heroes? Where are the statues for you know any of our resistance heroes? You go to somewhere like Peru, um, and you go to somewhere like Cusco, right in the middle of the centre square, they have a, a statue of um, Tupac. And Tupac is not the Tupac Shakur, the rapper that we're talking about. <laughs> he was actually named after a resistance fighter for the Quechuan speaking people of Peru. And they have these huge golden statues of these resistance warriors pointing towards the sea and pointing towards where the Spanish came from. You know, we have such powerful Im imagery all over the world but not in this country. Um, there's actually a famous picture, I think, of two Aboriginal guides crouching down around like one of these colonial images. I know that um, it's in Ali Mayer's book because that was one of the statues that they wanted to deface and get decapitate first off. Um, and there's been a wave and wave and wave, like Uncle Ken said, you know, we've been talking about this stuff, it's not just you know, I have issues with this whole wokeness, this whole trend of being conscious and being aware of this stuff. When, you know, there has been people that have been talking about this for a very, very long time. Even in my life, I've been talking about statues of Pemaway. You know, and then white people have then named the suburb after him and filled it with people that he died fighting to keep out. You know, so can you understand how contorted and distorted that they represent our history? But of course, history is only ever written in the eyes of the colonisers. So again, what happens to the colonised? And this is what happens. We're still fighting for the control of the narrative. <coughs> so everywhere white men attempted to push invasion further was met by Aboriginal warriors resisting that invasion. Dundali, Jandamara and Yagan are just some of them. Go and look up what has happened. Look up this history because it is accessible. <coughs> Years of protection and assimilation, government policies of eugenics and slavery left our people confined to the outskirts of towns, managed by missionaries, preaching a few words, preaching the words of, white, of a white god who loved the hard-working, unfortunate black man for his free labour. Policies of forcible removal of firstly half-caste children and then any Aboriginal child identified by the state as a potential participant for their social programming experiments. They prosecuted our people for speaking language and practising culture and they prohibited travel and, for, and forced that foreign 
worldview ideology onto Aboriginal people. And again, they don't correlate, which can result in a lot of very negative cognitive dissonance, which then affects the way that we function and communicate. Um, you know, when I talk to kids today, we talk about all these policies and we talk about all these things that have become barriers between us and connecting country and culture and language and family. And it's, it's important to be reminding everybody about this so that the next generation of young people aren't blaming themselves <coughs> and they're not projecting that toxicity onto our own people. I'm sorry to say, but you fellas got a lot to answer for. And when I say you fellas, I'm talking about white people, I'm talking about institutions, I'm talking about a whole lot of colonialism. Um, you know, so there's a lot here at stake. And again, I will not sit by and watch another generation of young Aboriginal people blame themselves for things that they have no control over. Which is why we're always educating and talking about the legacy and trying to uplift and talk about the deadly things that we've inherited as a part of this oral culture, this oral history that has only started to be recorded in the last, what, 30, 40 years? Since we started having black academics that were controlling that narrative. So, in 1806, the explorer de Urville describes a great gathering of Aboriginal clans assembled near the present Central Railway for a ritual payback combat over the death of Benelong's son, Dicky, one year earlier. Those taking part includes clans from the Hunter River, Emu Plains, Broken Bay and Illawarra. And apparently around, just before, I think, about 10 years before, I think, there was um, a recorded spearing of an officer in Chippendale by Pemawoy, either Pemawoy or Pemawoy's men. So when I talk about this community, I talk about people like Pemawoy knowing every single rock and stream that was here. Like how I know every single corner and every crack in the pavement and every graffiti that's been thrown up on the walls. They're all the same things. We're reading country, we're reading things. We're being able to decipher a lot more than what you clearly see. And again, you know, we're always trying to get people to look at things with Aboriginal eyes, and that is being able to peel back the layers and understand what this country is. So say, for example, if we was to be able to, if before these buildings were built and we were looking out this way, we'd be able to see the marshes and the swamplands that came up from Blackwater Bay. Um, you know, I often talk about Redfern. Without all these buildings here, we would actually be able to see the harbour. We would actually be able to hear the harbour. And I have this theory that before, before white people came here and destroyed the tank streams and a lot of the river systems, the intricate waterways that have developed over thousands and thousands and thousands of years were destroyed like that in two or three years. You know, these things are now being turned into the canal. Um, you know, and there's, I like to imagine all of these waterways when they were in their full strength. It would have been a lot like the Kimberleys. It would have been very hard to get in and out unless you knew how to come in and out, which is why it was so hard for them, white people in Sydney Cove, to get any further. But I often tell the kids to imagine being able to get from King's Cross to, or you know, up around Elizabeth Bay or Bot Bot Bondi <coughs> to the back of Maryville on a canoe. And that's just how intricate and beautiful our water systems were back then. Um, you know, it's completely different today. Sydney, of course, was chosen um, as the site for the new colony because of the tank stream and because of the um, source of fresh water here. Um, so then at the end of the 19th century, there were increasingly insistent calls for the removal of indigenous people from the streets of Sydney. The city's population had grown from, from 54,000 in 1851 to 96,000 in 1861 and 383,000 by 1891. There was evidence of Aboriginal families living in boat sheds in Circular Quay in 1830, with many moving out to La Perouse, Botany Bay in South Sydney. 1888, uh, 1886, influx of people from Illawarra, Barragong Valley and the Hunter River. Aboriginal people still frequented the freshwater springs of Piermont well until 1870. In 1879, the families in Circular Quay and around the foreshore um, near the 
Museum of Contemporary Art today were once were moved on because Sydney was staging an international exhibition and they wanted to hide the side of Sydney from visitors. The families were encouraged to move to the newly established reserve in La Perouse, which is the first of its kind. When I say first of its kind, it was the first reserve, the first mission, the first designated area that Aboriginal people could live and and walk about without being threatened with being shot at. The Aboriginal families that were moved on headed towards the next available source of fresh drinking water, which was situated in the swamps and marshes of Redfern and Waterloo. Which always brings it back to Redfern and Waterloo. There was a high population of Aboriginal people living there because at that time the only jobs that Aboriginal people had were picking cotton, picking fruit. So when they moved to the cities, the only jobs that they were qualified for were jobs in the factories and the rail yards which is why there was such a huge concentration of the population here in Redfern, because of the carriage works, the rail yards there, and because of all the factories there. Um, so, again, there's a story about, I always tell people when we um, do little tours, because I have created tours around my community, um, you know, again, controlling that narrative and educating other people. Um, so, when the park was created, Redfern Park, the local swamp had to be drained before this. The cricket games would have had to pause to help the local farmer across the road um, to pull his cows out of the swamp. The palm trees that still remain in Redfern Park were given to the local community by John the Baptist, who owned the local garden that fed Colonial Sydney. So Redfern was allowed to kind of be a marketplace and a, a, a pretty place for the ladies to lunch, who were the wives and officers of the governors. Um, again, you know, there was always Aboriginal presence there. Um, so the block in modern times was the subject of a large protest in the early 1970s when landlords in the area conducted a campaign of evicting all Aboriginal res residents. A group of campaigners led by the future judge Bob Belair successfully lobbied, successfully lobbied the Whitlam government to transfer ownership of the block to the Aboriginal Housing Company in 1972. The area was significant as an affordable source of low-cost housing for disadvantaged Aboriginal people. The Whitlam government introduced the policy of self-determination in 1972 and Bob Belair went on to become one of Australia's first Indigenous judges. He was also a director of both the Aboriginal Medical Service and the Aboriginal Legal Service. So, the Aboriginal Medical Service was set up in 1971 and the great Fred Hollows explains in his biography the local Aboriginal people started to outline the case for a medical service and they were utterly convincing. Blacks weren't welcome in the doctor's surgeries. They got pushed to the back of the line in casual, casualty wards and public hospitals. So all of the AMSs in the country were modelled on the original frameworks that were established here by local grassroots people in Redfern and with Mum Shell championing support for local young <coughs> Aboriginal people to create culturally appropriate community services for their communities. So when we talk about Redfern being the birthplace of black self-determination as we know it, this is black self-determination in action. <coughs> so we also talk about black theatre as just being as much about land rights and the political movement as the Aboriginal legal, legal service. <coughs> so the people who were involved in the establishment of the country's first Aboriginal community control organisations like the legal service and medical service were also involved with the creation of a public forum so that young Aboriginal people could artistically express themselves without discrimination and they called this the National Black Theatre. So National Black Theatre was a theatre company run by a small, a small group based in Sydney, based in Redfern. The original concept for the theatre grew out of political struggles, especially the land rights demonstrations, which at, which at the time were being organised by the Black Moratorium Committee, including people like Gary Foley and Michael Paul Coe. The centre held workshops in modern dancing, tribal <coughs> dancing, writing for theatre, karate and photography, and provided a venue for new Aboriginal drama. It also ran drama classes under Brian Siren, who conducted the first of a planned series of six-week full-time workshops for his students who include Jack Davis, Freddie Reynolds, Maureen Watson, who's just behind me here, who's another in front of the microphone. As a black poet, I'm always talking about people like Annie Maureen, because I have the pleasure of working with then great nieces. Um, Ross Watson's daughter, um, Teela Watson, who performs under the name of Ancestress because she embodies the message of our ancestors today. Um, I, I'm, I'm privileged to be able to work with 
descendants of the same people that were all working together 40, 50 years ago. And we're still continuing that message. So we've got Lillian Crom Crombie. These people went on to become known in the Aboriginal community for their work in the Australian theatre and film industries. And there's many more to mention. You know, um, I've obviously picked this up when I was studying at uni. Um, when we talk about, you know, what happened with black theatre, um, when, I, when I started talking to people, they were saying once that um, they started accepting government funding, that was sort of the beginning of the end. Because they were no longer accountable to the community, they became accountable to their funding sources. Which is why today we're always pushing for private funding. We're always pushing for support from the community, you know, from you guys that have inherited the wealth of this country to be able to leverage that privilege now. You know this history, you know what you have to do. But unfortunately a lot of people don't want to part with their, their inherited comfortability. So the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council was established at the Black Theatre in 1973, illustrating its value as a community hub, with the first chairperson, Billy Craigie, also being one of the four men who set up the Aboriginal Ten Embassy in 1972. So my uncle Billy Craigie married my, mom, my mother's sister, Annie, as well. Um, you know, and these very, again, when we talk about these people, I'm talking about aunties and uncles, I'm talking about grandparents, I'm talking about people that I've had, you know, teach me specific things around my mother's table. Um, and Uncle Billy always deserves a mention because of the act, um, you know, one of the things that he was, um, he was asked in 1988, after all the marches down to government, um, sorry, Lady Macquarie's chair, and they set up a, an embassy there and claimed that space. Um, there, he was asked to, to launch um, a book about the bicentenary and he agreed to launch this book and when he got to the steps of the Opera House where they had this big media scrum and launch and all this sort of stuff my uncle Bill was the type of person and this, these sort of stories describe this personality he was talking about the book and talking about the bicentenary and talking about genocide and he got a bit worked up in this whole <coughs> sort of media PR thing. <coughs> and he's talking about how inappropriate he, it was for him to have asked, for him to have been asked to launch a book about the bicentenary and about celebrating colonialism and genocide. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, these are not his exact words, but he said, I'll launch the book all right, and he chucked it in the harbour. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> this same man, um, apparently, after Gary Foley had um, met Harold Thomas um, and moved or took the Aboriginal flag that we now know today, the Harold Thomas um, design, took that from South Australia um, and then brought it to the embassy. And so originally the flag was red on top with the black down the bottom. So people in my generation, when they see dated photos of the red being on top, they get really like, you know, want to correct it. And they're like, oh, it's black on top, it's black on top, that's upside down. But the generation that I come from has been born into a series of inherited distress that they're not actually aware of the fact that the flag was originally red on top. It was my uncle who turned it upside down to signify an international distress call back in 1970s. Awesome. Mm. So, you know, a lot of our young people today don't realise what that symbolises. So, people like me ask the question, when is it going to be restored? <coughs> when are we going to be able to put that red back on top and have it the original way? Because right now, we all believe that with the black on the top, that that's distress. how it's supposed yeah. to be. Yeah. Which, which signifies yeah. the state of distress yeah. that my generation has been born in. Yeah. Um, so in 2005, the Indigenous Land Corporation acquired the buildings on Cope Street that had been occupied by Red Fern Radio um, and National Black Theatre. A new building to house the recording studios and offices of the Gadigal Information Service was designed by the architectural firm Tonkin blah, 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 blah. Sorry, it's really gets on my nerves a bit. Because we're talking about the new forms of gentrification. So all of these images that we see were from 1983 to 88, right? which was the year that I was born. 
My mum was pregnant with me when she was marching in that huge march, and we are yet to see a march that big for Aboriginal issues. Um, you know, so I like to say I was there in spirit. <laughs> My whole being was formed from those cries and those, you know, um, slogans and things like that. Um, you know, my wires were connecting in my brain at this time when all this stuff was happening outside, um, you know. So I'm very much a product of that Black Power movement. So when we talk about it, there's so many different ways, like let us count the ways. Um, so, you know, a lot of people today get confused with native title and land rights. A lot of people today, my age, they will say, well, we fought for native title. And it's like, no, 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 we didn't. All these marches were for land rights. Native title is a much watered down <coughs> legislation that has controlled our people. And I would just, I found a quote actually by the great honourable ancestor, Uncle Ross Watson. Um, and it's just, uh, it's just a couple of dot points. It says native title legislation is about recognising Aboriginal people's connection and rights to land and water. Land rights legislation in New South Wales is about compensating Aboriginal people for past dispossession, dislocation and removal of land. So we can see how ownership is really different to recognising <coughs> someone's ownership. So when people like my grandmother and my mother and my uncles and my dad and my grandfather and, and you know the people, some of the people that are sitting at this table, when they talk about um, the Aboriginal Land Rights Act, they're talking about being the landowners being the landlords of their own land. Um, and I just find it interesting that outside of Redfern, when the whole for frameworks for Aboriginal land councils were growing, one of the first places outside of Redfern was in a little tiny town that my mum came from called Cow. Was from, um, was in a mission called Arambi. Now, a lot of the first Aboriginal plays were set on the Arambi mission. Um, you know, that had that connection with black theatre again. Um, so Cake Man um, and Cherry Pickers, they were all set on a Rambi mission. So I think it's really fitting that a lot of these Aboriginal community controlled organisations, my mother took them back to her hometowns. And this is how our services spread, is that our people got trained up here and then they took stuff back to their communities. And this is why we talk about a lot of, a lot of things coming from here. A lot of the country's firsts not just Aboriginal history, but in the white colonial industrial history as well. Which I find it so interesting that the government and the councils are so ready to get rid of buildings that are supposed to be heritage listed and things like that, you know, because that's their own history they're destroying there. Um, so a lot of these images that we see are from those protests. But the first land council outside of Redfern was actually established in my grandmother's backyard. And I just find it funny that this whole... Oh, I'll sorry, I'll out this um, but I just find it funny that the only image of her is of half of her head and her sunglasses. <coughs> so, you know, when we talk about land rights and we talk about um, frameworks that have been watered down, that a lot of people get confused and they think that native title is such a good thing, but it only benefits certain people and it really only benefits the mining companies which again was one of the things that kick-started the whole land rights movement. Was it, was it not Uncle Ken? Well, <laughs> well, we want to keep the mining companies out. Yeah, that's <laughs> the, exactly right. Though. And what Native <coughs> Title has done is open up a gateway where they can get in. That's, that's the whole difference, you know. Land rights was about us being back on our traditional lands, not mining companies. Native Title, watered down by the famous Keating, Everybody said it was the greatest Prime Minister that ever lived. I'm well, afraid he stabbed us in the back. Um, was designed to allow other people, the industry, in there. Mm -hmm. That's all it's ever done. And it's divided communities. I'm it's, sorry to tuck, you, tuck yeah. you in there, but it's just, you know, very important. I feel like I'm a bit like a, a record player sometimes because I feel like I'm saying the same thing over and over and over again. And I wasn't even alive when all this stuff happened. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to read a quote from um, Uncle Ross. Um, 
It says Amari from the Dawson River explains land rights from an Aboriginal perspective. Land rights means a spiritual and economic base, not in a profit and loss way, and the opportunity to once again become a self-determining people. We are not asking for land rights to be given or granted. We are demanding recognition of our rights to our own land. Land rights includes religious fishing, hunting, camping rights. If currently forbidden on all the relevant Crown land, land rights includes our right to refuse mining on any part of our land. So you can understand why it was a bit, a bit dangerous to be legislated back then and why it's been so watered down and does not represent what our people fought for back then. Which brings me to my closing notes, I guess. So a lot of the a lot of the spaces that I've been able to develop and grow my worldview are because of the fights from our previous people. It's because of their push to be able to create safe black spaces in the form of the dance theatre, in the form of theatre, in the form of Redfern School, who was, which was a public school but had a really close relationship with the Aboriginal community. You know, I was privileged to be able to have people like Chica Dixon come into our classrooms, which I don't see that sort of stuff happening anymore. You know, my mother used to actually come to the classrooms with the <coughs> primary school kids and the high school kids. And that is something that I'm pushing for working in the institutions today, is always to connect into Aboriginal communities and having Aboriginal people control the narrative. Because there's a lot of push and shove when it comes to the curriculum and how we talk about Australian history today. So Marawena is was a preschool, one of the first formed in this country based on culturally appropriate educational programs. So Marawena was actually created out of a breakfast program that Aunty Shirley, and Aunty Shirley again I failed to mention that she's my grandmother's auntie, so she's my great great auntie. And in Aboriginal law she'd be a great great grandmother for me because she is someone that we keep talking about. When we talk about statues actually, she's the only one that has a statue in anywhere in Sydney. Yeah, she's Mum Cheryl. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, um, so Mum Cheryl was one of the people that pushed for Marawena. Marawena was following the Black Power um, breakfast programs and community services. Um, a lot of them people, they, they said that they had to take up guns to force people out of medical buildings to then take them over. They'd had to do a lot of things with force. So a lot of people, you know, from mum and that generation, they were influenced from all these radical thinking people. And they were doing really ground, like really basic groundwork, but not basic in the way that it denotes it, but basic in the basic services need to be met. So they had a, a breakfast program because the kids were going to school hungry. So they had a breakfast program to feed the kids, <coughs> talk to them a little bit about you know, their day and wish them a good day. And then that, that became the framework for the first preschool um, you know, that I had the pleasure of going to, where we had white teachers there as well that were called auntie, just as much as our, our black educators were called auntie. The whole emphasis was about assimilating white people into our worldview. So, which brings us to now and some of the things that I guess I'm trying to do in my community and trying to remind people about how deadly this community was and what it has given to other people in the hopes that your mob start to give something back now. So whatever that is, whatever you can give back, that's the time to start thinking about that. That's the time to start educating your people about all this history so we don't have to keep reliving the trauma of having to educate you fellas <coughs> about stuff that we all share and we've all been a part of. So, the history and legacy of Aboriginal resistance is also the future for this country. This country, if it does not have a black future, it has no future at all. And I guess that I, that's a good note to leave it on. So, Thank you for Thank inviting you. me. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Uh, the whole time, sorry, I just want to mention I have, I have my old family <coughs> doctor here that was actually taking care of mum when she was pregnant with me. So again, you know, it's always overwhelming to sit here and talk, surrounded by such a, you know, such. I don't know, how they all reconnect. We're all connected some way. It's just a matter of you finding out how. And that's exactly how I talk to my students.
you know, um, you fellas living on our country. So you should you should have been assimilated into our worldview because if that would have happened at the start, we would not have be experiencing a lot of the things that we're talking about and having to unpack and understand today. So again, yeah, sorry to cut you off, Michael, but thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Amazing. Lauren was always a standout in the guests. It wasn't hard to say um, to Lorna that you were going to do all right. <laughs> it was not hard to say. Some others have tended to disappoint me. They went through the same time and yeah, they came in black and went out white. That's what it's the do, eh? Became very assimilated. And I saw my role there as working as an academic and cultural advisor to try and stop that. You can't all the time, but when you get somebody like Lorna who went there, you knew there was never going to be an assimilated process. She was always coming in. She came in black, she was going on our black. And uh, <coughs> that's why, I would, you know, we always had a lot of conversations there. In the like, hallways? Yeah, just standing there having a yard. You know, and there, there, was, there was a certain amount of students that I couldn't relate to there, but there was something that you knew were going off the other way. They've gone off the other way, I won't mention. But you look on it here, this is such, this is so proud to be part of these. I've got a, a little photo sitting up there. That I was there that day that was happening. There's another little brochure there with me now. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm looking at other people there and I'm thinking about things you were talking about before. I'm looking at the late Jerry Boston, mm. who was part of the Black Theatre as well. And yeah. Jerry was such an interesting, smart fellow. He was very clever. He went all over Australia, all over the country, and he went into every traditional nation and he talked to everybody about prior to 1788, how many people do you think would have this land sustained? He did this <coughs> twice. The first time he did it on his own, the second time he took some academics with it. Both times they came back with a conservative estimate. Prior to 1788, there would have been five to eight million people here. Five to eight million. When they started counting this in the mid 1800s, some you know, 72 years later or whatever, 50,000. We talk about genocide overseas. Now, even if you cut that number in half that Jerry was talking about, five to eight million, that's a lot of people that were slaughtered over a lengthy period of time. But when you look, and I followed up some of that research myself when people were saying how, ma how many would have been on this land, you can quite easily see there would have been easily five million people here, easily. And that's, that's something that uh, a lot of people have taken in. And we look at now, uh, we're looking at the history of practice. Who owns the voice? This is good to see because here we actually can see who protested, how people protested. Around this time, I was doing research with Terry Bostock again for a doco we wanted to make called Through Our Eyes. Eight part documentary series. We got offered $10,000 by the French government. Nobody in this country wanted to know us. You couldn't make one episode with it. One of the episodes was on germ warfare using smallpox in this country, which we had researched heavily on the first fleet. Two jars of a substance called Major's variolus, dried smallpox scare. The rationale for giving it, uh, for bringing it out here was um, to uh, scientifically <coughs> examine the whole phenomenon of smallpox. Everybody was inoculated before they came there. The, if you're going to start a new colony, I don't think scientific research is your first priority. I think mean, <laughs> trying to find somewhere for people to live. So that, that, that was quickly debunked. But what was interesting when I first started. Uh, trying to get this public, two things happen. Who owns history and who can talk about history? Um, I was interviewed by SBS at length about this, and when it went to air, I started the interview with the history of this country being built on lies. From that, I went into the research I've been doing about Majors Variolus. The only thing they put on air was the history of this country was built on lies, and they cut to something else. <laughs> One week later, a professor from the University of New South Wales got a two-page spread on exactly the same thing uh, in uh, the Sydney 
uh, in, uh, the Telegraph, the uh, Sunday Telegraph. Now, within months, the ABC had rang me up and said, we believe you've been researching germ warfare. I said, yes. They said, we're going to have a panel discussion. So I'm thinking, well, be oh, great. This will, this will be fun. I'll get on TV, have a, have a bit of an air raid on TV for a change. And I asked them, I said, what do you want them to be able to see it? They said, we don't want you. We want your research. We, and I'm not joking. This woman said to me, we have a white panel of experts who want to debate it. And I said, oh, that's great. So all this research we and my colleague have done means nothing. And I mentioned Jerry coming on as well. Now, we have experts to debate, but we want to know, we want your research. Well, anyway, we answer turned the air blue. Um, it's also interesting to note that, that a whole figure of five to eight million people and then looking at it in the 1800s, mid 1800s, down to 50,000. We're looking now at we're part of a colonial government that's decimating populations overseas. We haven't learned our lesson yet. We slaughtered a whole <coughs> tribal nations. We wiped out whole tribal nations of this country and we still have not learned our lessons. If you look now, since the Royal Commission of Aboriginal Deaths and Custody, and a lot of those images reflect the 23rd of September, uh, September every year when we had the mark, uh, march mark, marking the anniversary of the death of young John Pat. Since they had the Royal Commission, uh, the deaths and custody has almost doubled. This government has not learned and it will not learn. We have to fight things twice. <coughs> Lorna mentioned um, the day, the, the day morning, 1938 day morning. Prior to that, a group has gone to the Heritage Court and fought a battle with the Heritage, in the Heritage Court. The, the judge found in our favour that it should be kept and maintained as a place of significant value, significant spiritual value to Aboriginal people, found in our favour. There was a whole group, some of the descendants of the people who were there were part of that campaign. <coughs> and I thought, well, this is good, I'll go back to Queensland now, that's a good way. Okay. That's a nice victory to leave on. I get up in Queensland and I read a few weeks later that Bob Carr overturned the Heritage Commission's order that for the first time in the history of this country, a Premier overturned a Heritage Commission's order. So Lorna's family had to start from scratch as if nothing had ever happened and had to fight the battle again. And they changed the Heritage Laws, have they not? Yeah, they changed the Heritage Laws so it. we couldn't go to court again and win the way we did, so they had to fight again. And again, there was a, a bit of few rounds to get that, that building. And no, no one but that small group was interested <coughs> in that building. <coughs> and that building, again, you know, um, that is also the genesis of the whole day of mourning versus the day of invasion, celebrating invasion. You know, when we talk about, you know, this, this conversation that comes up every 26th of January, was started by the actions of these people in 1938. Um, you know, and it took my mum, apparently, 1,938 days to be able to have that uh, place protected and heritage listed and owned by the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Trust. Well, this is after a judge had ordered, this is after a heritage judge had ordered and then Bob Carr overturned it. Pardon? In Elizabeth Street? Elizabeth Street, the non it's called Australia House, unfortunately. No, there were community groups. Well, the 1938 day of mourning is recognised. Well, the 1938 day of mourning is recognised as the first national I was, I was civil rights movement. On that day. No. And it happened there. Now, a lot of our, a lot of our activists, a lot of the people you see there, they, um, we were always inspired by Hemingway. We were always inspired by. All of our activists that came through, but the people who were involved in 1938 day of mourning were our modern day heroes. And to see them slapped down like that by Bob Carr was unforgivable. It was totally unforgivable. So um, there's no way if anybody ever mentions me, Bob Carr was a nice bloke, or I'd likely to go right off the deep end. Um, a lot of, when, when we're talking about families, we do come from a history of. Um, we did come from a history of activism. We, we've been going through, my family 
for years and years and uh, my old, old grandmother, they gave her the name of Jane Boyd. We saw written a police uh, um, report about dear old Granny <coughs> Boyd. Was, uh, she was actually there in that country before the whites come, that south coast Queensland where Charlotte or Norbertella, that's where her families come from. Um, she was there before the whites come and they give her the name Jane Boyd. But um, she was written up as um, Jane Boyd is a, a, um, an associate of Chinese gardeners. My granny reckons the association was a little bit closer than talking anyway. Um, and they said she was an opium smoker, which was dicey. But they said she was armed with stolen rifles from the police and would shoot at police. That's something in our oral history we already knew. So then my granny used to tell me about how her mother used to take pot shots at her. Now remember, when you, when you look at that, influences in our grand she never used to talk that much she was crippled up in bed but i remember coming from out west once and i always talk when people say what gave you this strength or what what put you on the road this is what put me on the road i don't know it might have been about seven and we we're in brisbane from out west and granny's crippled legs she's got a big walk and sick car there and she wants to go from over queen street before it was more news she wanted to go across the road and all my cousins said, there's a crossing up here. She reckoned, why would I go to the crossing up there when I want to go across there? And I reckon, well, there's all cars going. She said, well, they can stop. So my cousins all ran up to where the crossing was, and I was stuck with my gran, and this was the biggest feeling I've ever had in my life to date. The biggest powerful feeling. This old woman stepped out on the road with a walking stick held up in one hand and a hat held up in the other hand. And this car pulled off a halt and he dared be to torn her. She swore at him, she turned the air blue, and she smacked the walking stick on the hood. And she said, you are on Aboriginal land, don't you dare do that to me. Walked across the road. Now that would have been, I was seven, I was born in 1952, that was probably 1959, 1960. In a time where a lot of bad things were happening and that, and I looked at the time, when I walked across the street behind her and saw the whole traffic stop, then my cousins, silly cousins come run, what's going on, what's going on? I'm walking behind her, I was a little kid, a real little skinny kid I was, a real little rat of thing, and anyway, um, I felt about 10 foot tall. Because this woman just stopped the traffic or something. I was just amazed. I, I remember being absolutely in awe of my grand always, but at that particular time, she became my lifelong hero. And it didn't dawn on me the impact that had me on me later on in life. That had an impact that whenever we had to go take to the streets, I always remembered that. Whenever you felt fear, I always remembered this woman just walking straight out the middle of Queen Street. I thought, anything could happen to her, but she didn't. And this is this is the lines of people we come from. These are the and. The nature of who we are is we always acknowledge this. I don't, I've got no strength within myself. I've got no strength within myself. I've got strength from those who went before me. Those who went before me directly as my ancestors. Those who went before me as famous freedom fighters. All were part who gave me anything I have. I've written a book here. That doesn't entirely belong to me. The influences of that book belong to a whole variety of people and most of them are sitting on that wall. And if it wasn't for the way we value the people who went before us, you mentioned Uncle Chicka Dix and I sit down and talk to him for hours on end. If we didn't value the advice of those people, we wouldn't be here with them. Lorna knows that I know. Lorna's parents know that. They've always said that. Always there's been people who went before us and it's just, sometimes it's a, it's a tragedy that we have to keep going through this and we're looking at recognition now, we're looking at people talking about statues. We've got Mum Shirl out in front of the Redfern Medical Centre, which is not 
prominent where a lot of people would see yeah. it. No, I've seen it. We've yeah, got Lorna's mother with a, a big painting in the city, which is down near Chinatown. Yeah, yeah. No, actually. It's sort of almost in the back street. But anyway, mm. where are the main statues of all of our frontier warriors, of all of our modern day heroes, of the people in the 1938 day of mourning, of every. We could fill the Hyde Park ten times over. But what I see, my wife Cheryl pointed out one day, we were down at Parliament House. What I saw was, uh, she, she said, have a look at this. There's a statue of Matthew Flinders' cat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Matthew Flinders' yeah. cat gets a run. The only thing that the cat had in his the cat had in his favour was Blake. Yeah, 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 the biggest yeah, 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 my heart goes out to this you know, lovely dog. <laughs> I wish I had one like it. But where, where is our representation? If you can honour a dog and a cat, why the hell can't you honour the people of this country? And also, don't okay. forget, you've got Queen Victoria's dog. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sitting Queen, behind Queen, Queen Victoria's dog gets a run too. So. That, that, that statue was actually gifted. From Ireland. From Ireland, because they didn't want it. I know. They said, it's ugly. And Australia was like, we'll take it. I know. <laughs> yeah, this, so they didn't want it That was from, it's the, ugly. from the Republic of Ireland. Yeah, yeah, they didn't want it. Yeah, I went to Ireland and heard that story, and I was just like, oh my gosh. Yeah, it's an ugly statue. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what I'm what I'm concerned with with this um, this hiding away of history and this lack of acknowledgement. Again, if you go to the other side of um, <coughs> Central Station, <coughs> walk along, you'll find busts of people. Those mm. Port Portuguese guys who fought yeah. overseas. Well, yeah. They yeah. even they even yeah. get it wrong. Yeah. They've yeah. got Rizal yeah. for the Philippines, where he was an academic. Yeah. Yeah. The person who actually over th who was responsible for overthrowing the Spanish yeah. was Bonifacio, mm -hmm. so they've got that wrong. Let me wrong them. The Spanish rather have re history record that they were overthrown by an academic yeah. rather than an illiterate man from the mountains, and that's what that was all about. But at least the Australian government has an attempt to show somebody that is in the history books from another country for overthrowing the oppressor but will not recognise our heroes in this country. And there's a big, big line of them that go along and have a look at them. them. And it, it, is, <laughs> it is disgusting. But what's more them? disgusting is have you seen them while this is hidden away, yeah. the repetition yeah. of history goes on yeah. and distracted. on and on. Yeah. Now, we had Kevin Rudd in 2008 offer an <coughs> apology to the stolen generations. And the whole country wept but the kids being stolen since 2008 has increased by 400%. So history, while I, while I keep <coughs> hiding things away, now do you read those figures in the newspaper? No, you don't read those figures in the newspaper. I don't blame people for being ignorant to this because you're not informed. You're not informed since the Northern Territory intervention, the suicide rate has gone up a massive 500%. You're not informed that since the intervention, 87% uh, of the adult population are Aboriginal, 96% in juvenile detention is Aboriginal. You're not informed of that. This is, by the way, the intervention has seen as a success. That's seen as a success. I mentioned Keating before with the Night of Title Act. Keating, when he made the famous Redford speech, we were in Canberra, the group was from Canberra trying to find a meeting which we knew was happening. The top four QCs in the country, at the behest of Keating, were meeting to make sure a Marbo's like decision did not happen on mainland Australia. We wanted to we wanted to take footage of that meeting. We couldn't find it now, hidden away, but we had information it was happening. So he's making a speech while he's standing us in the back. Bob Hawke announces the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody to hide the fact that he scrapped a National Land Rights Act that people had agreed on. He scrapped it after meeting with three mining magnates from Western Australia. So whether we, you know, whether I was in the agreement of that National Land Rights Act or not, 
It's not the point. A lot of people were and it will stand by consensus. He meets with three people and bang, it's gone out the window. To hide the fact he announces the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, which we know is a $60 million waste of time because more than 100 deaths were investigated and I won't go into it, but some of them were blatant murders. <coughs> And the evidence showed they were blatant murders, but yet not one prison officer or policeman was even charged with a minor assault. As a matter of fact, if you look at the history of this country, we have not had a prison officer or police officer found guilty of the death of an Aboriginal person yet. Ever. Now, that's a sad indictment. It is a shame in this country. And I, I work with ISSU, Indigenous Social Justice Association. We. Um, we work mainly with families who, unfortunately, their relatives, uh, I don't say killed in custody because anything you can be killed in a fight, murdered in custody, which a lot of it is. And we have come to the conclusion that the rate is a lot higher than ever has been report reported. We have people in Western Australia who are giving us figures that are, t that are alarming. You wouldn't believe it. There are that many people being killed, it's happening in nearly every second day now. But uh, it's been hidden away in the media. It's only when uh, cases come out that are so blatantly racist as Elijah Doherty come out that you hear about it. But a lot of deaths come about and nobody ever gets to know about it. But it's not only that, it's the incarceration rate. Look at Aboriginal women in the last... Uh, in the last five years, the incarceration of uh, Aboriginal women has gone up tenfold. Tenfold. Where else is that happening in the community? As a matter of fact, in this country, if you're Aboriginal, you're 54 times more likely to be arrested than a non-Aboriginal person. A black woman is 46 more times to be hospitalised because of an act of violence. Mm -hmm. You know, we can go on and on and on with this statistics, but Steps. I think you've got to look it up, you know? We, we, and we, these are things way back then. These are the messages, the very same messages. As a matter of fact, before I went to the Philippines the last time, I just come back, I was giving a speech outside Parliament House and I said, I stood here saying the same thing 30 years ago. What am I doing still here? Why am I still here? 30 years ago. The same speech 30 years ago. And when you realise what happens in that 30 years, I mean, it's all over the world. If you look at the Philippines, they, they don't even, you know, you look at a, a third world nation. I had a talk to a lot of people there. Indigenous peoples in the Philippines have far more rights than our peoples do here. Despite what people are saying is going on there now, people have been conned by the Western <coughs> media, by the way. I saw footage over there that's old file footage from stuff that was happening 10, 20 years ago. It's being swallowed up by the Western media. Um, but you get on the ground there where the government, the, the incumbent government has an 82% following, um, you soon find out the real story. The real story is, and you ask Indigenous peoples in the Philippines about what rights they have, they have veto over mining rights. Now they do. They didn't under the Kino government, but now they do. What has happened in recent months is a lot of mines that were opened by Kino on Indigenous lands were shut down by Duterte because they were on native land. He said, get out. That belongs to these people. We have a third world country that's suing far more for Indigenous peoples than we have in a first world country. And yet, this person's being um, described as some murderous dictator. That's another argument. But, and that's not the argument for today, but if you look at historically, they had a man called Kulapulapu, who speared Magellan. To ridicule him, they changed his name to Lapulapu, which means codfish. Kulapulapu has a completely different name. We have a resistance warrior who fought with Pebble Boy. And the only name he is known by in the history books is Mosquito. Because they couldn't even bother finding out what his name was. And these are the things that make me angry with the recording of history. I'm like like uh, Lorna, I'm a fanatic on history. And it cost me a lot of UTS. I did my masters in history. 
At one stage, I was suspended from studying for eight years because the historians could not cope with the idea that I had another view of history than that they did. And I had people on the Postgraduate Studies Committee who were on side with me, who would report to me what the Postgraduate Studies Committee were talking about, and some of the senior lecturers were saying, do you realise if he gets these theses up and running, he'll be lecturing here and we won't? And that's what it was about. Again, who owns history? This is why exhibitions like this should come out. Because that clearly shows, looking at the protests of Aboriginal people in this country has come from us. I've often heard over the years, oh, you, a, a lot of concessions have been made on your behalf. On your behalf, no, we fought for it. When some of these photos, these people were involved in struggles in the 1970s, and as Lorna pointed out, in the 1970s. All these great organisations opened. Unfortunately, I was incarcerated from 1970 to 1979. I missed out on the struggle. There. But let me tell you, within the prison system, Aboriginal prisoners were politicised. I know up in Queensland, in Bogger Road, we had our own little club who used to sit around and talk about the whole reason we were there. And we knew why we were there. The politics of why we were there. We knew it, and we knew that very much way back then that we were actually in the middle of a war. And the war included killing us in custody and included locking us up forever and a day. As a matter of fact, in, the 90, in certain parts of the 1970s, it was hard to find an Aboriginal male between the age of 18 and 35 in the streets of Brisbane. They're all in Bogger Road or up in Townsville. So, even there, I remember Freddie Peters little coming to me because she was a kid and went to the ten embassy and she was making a doc about it. She came to me and she said, um, what did the ten embassy mean to you? And I said, solitary confinement. She said, what? Because she thought I was out. I said, no, uh, what happened was um, a lot of us had been active inside prison. When the ten embassy broke out, we were under the J.B. Angel Peterson regime, you might remember. So, when the ten embassy uh, broke out, um, we were put all put into solitary. Because they thought we'd escape and go down to Canberra and cause havoc. Matter of fact, I was actually planning an escape, but not to go to Canberra, I was trying to get away. But the whole thing was, what does something mean to somebody? You know, if you're locked up, it meant a whole lot of different things. And what, I, what I, I'm also angry at, all these great things happened, but I was incarcerated. I was incarcerated for a long, long time, and not only did they incarcerate us, they brutalised us while we were in there. Can I just say you were in a cage? Three years, eight months I spent in a cage. Four paces square, small paces. Cell of a night, cage of a day. Cell of a night, cage of a day. I wasn't allowed out of either unless I was surrounded by the security squad and handcuffed. Now, that is not the treatment you would think would come out of this country. Nobody thinks that. We, we all think of Gu Guantanamo Bay. When I wrote a play about it recently, it was shown at the, um, it was uh, done, done a reading at uh, that festival. Like, Mugaladu. Yeah, yeah, Mugaladu. Yeah, yeah. Yalamundi Festival. And people were crying at the end of it. And I thought, well, at least I understood it, you know. But it was hard to write because I had to write about that period of time and try and capture what, what me and another fellow suffered during that time. Now what's interesting is I was always a very proud, despite my complexion, I let them know as soon as I came, went to jail who I was. It was hard not to be tough and relatives were there, so it didn't matter. But the other fellow in the cage for the long time was an origin who always mixed with Murray's. His father brought him up to be anti-colonial, and he very much was anti-colonial. As a matter of fact, when he got off the bus one day, we were both charged with some offences inside jail. He came back, had handcuffs on, was supposed to still salute him. He said, I refuse to salute the filthy Queen's uniform. I went over and was still worse than black <laughs> And he said, I'm Irish, I am a black And this was the war. 
we were involved in, and that's why I included his heritage in there. Because, like Lorna said, she went to Ireland. You didn't go to Ireland for nothing, did you? I, I well, went there because my uncle, um, uh, Marshall Bell, was a great artist, Uncle Richard Bell's brother. Mm. Um, he said, if you're in this part of the world, do me a, pay, do me a favour and go and visit um, you know, my, my brothers had adopted me and I adopted them when they came out to Australia. My uncle actually passed away a couple of days after he had taken um, that all up. So when we were in England for an indigeneity conference and um, talking about capitalism and what it's done to indigenous people all over the world, I was asked to talk about my practice as an artist and talk about how history and my spirituality influences my practice as an artist. So, um, you know, we was over there in London, we ended up taking off to Ireland for a week because we was in that part of the world. And it was one of my uncle's last things that he had actually done before he passed away. So, um, you know, I went over there and met with Uncle Frankie Quinn um, and Uncle Sean McKiernan, who were the photographers whose images about um, Belfast in the 90s and the 80s and the 70s um, those were the first images of the troubles that got out to the rest of the world. So, you know, I was staying with people um, that were also very politically active in their communities um, and they had, like, treated us like black queens, you know. They had literally taken care of us. They had um, one of the friends that was a historian did a little tour for us and the next day we spent a day at the gallery, you know, looking at archival footage and looking at a lot of the first prints um, because you know, the gallery that they had there in Belfast, it was made specifically to be a conduit for the community to be able to tell their stories. So what a lot of the old, older people in that community did, they bequeathed their family history stuff to this gallery. Um, so there was all these really, really old, early photographs or early depictions or engravings that become, you know, the, the, the early photographs at the time of before we, we had the technology. But the images that they have of the Irish people when they first, um, you know, were interacting with um, the English people at that time, they were actually looked very much like the images that were drawn in Sydney when English came here and they started interacting with Gadigal. So, you know, there's this big question about, um, you know, the Irish being the blacks of Europe. Um, and it was just because they got treated like the blacks of Europe. but. What they're starting to find out is that they actually had dark skin. Mm. Um, they actually, their, their lifestyles were very hunter-gatherer, and you know, I don't even like using that term again, but it was very much parallel with the way that, you know, Aboriginal pre-colonial well, society was. They were in tribal groups, but you look at the struggle, it's mirrored. It's been very mirrored, and we have a close relationship. Even as far back as Pemelwoy, escaped Irish convicts fought with Pemelwoy. Like the time's so short. When we look all over the country, escaped Irish convicts were fighting with Aboriginal people in the war against the British. Alongside them. Alongside them. Yeah. Yeah. Alongside there, them. there were a lot too that were displacing our people as yeah, well. Yeah, you yeah. Know? yeah. Um, yeah some of them were from my father's that. family. Yeah, my, yeah. I, I, I searched my father's family. They were Irish. They ended up traitors. They joined in the hunt for the Murrays in the Toowoomba area. When I, when I researched that, I, I went home and I was wanted, wanted to throw up. But my grandfather always told he disassociated with his family, but he always told me they were traitors. He said they were, they were Irish, but they were traitors. They came here and they got on side with the British. But they he, doesn't, he never spoke to them, so. Um, but, um, you know, and in my talk, I glazed over a lot of the modern day stuff. Um, I actually purposely gazed, glazed over that, and I just wanted to bring it back just before um, everyone sort of kept going, um, was to just um, address Elaine's question about what's been happening. Um, after TJ Hickey was killed, um, chased by the police, his, his murder is officially um, recorded as a death, death, in, death in custody. Um, you know, we can talk about the details of that. Um, we can go on and on and on, on, or you guys can research and look up, you know, some of the things um, that happened. A lot of the people, a lot of the times it's recorded as a riot. You know, when you look at those images, they're children. They're children protecting their safety. And as a child growing up in that era, and a child that knew someone like TJ, the fear that was instilled in us was, we're, we're still working through to the PTSD that we've established, like we've had as a part of all of that. 
as a part of the intergenerational trauma that we've inherited as well. You know, so in growing up in Redfern, I would I'd be strip searched on my way to school if Papa seen me. I'd be, um, you know, harassed and um, and catcalled by police at a very young age. Um, you know, all these things. Um, so when I talk about growing up, I didn't have a normal childhood. So I freaked out when I started going to with girls and I heard other girls talk to me about things that they did in the afternoons and it was a foreign thing for me. I couldn't walk around shopping centres without being followed by security guards. I couldn't walk around my own community with more than two people without being called again, um, you know, and, and being um, sent home and stuff like that or, or taken by the police but never actually charged. You just get taken for a ride all the time, um, you know. But after the 2004 riots, there was a legislation passed in um, Parliament that overstepped all the councils of the time and they created the Redfern Ward Law Authority. And the Redfern Ward Law Authority had pushed for the redevelopment and gentrification of the community. So redevelopment and building construction was the answer to the anti-social problem. So mm. tell me how does that equate? You know, um, and then they actually, uh, they actually brought in Aboriginal people from other communities to come here and do the work, which is again a very colonial thing to do. Like Argyle up in Kununurra, they got my husband's people to come on to Mirawong country and build the dam, which started conflict between them. It's called divide and rule. Exactly, divide and conquer, and that's exactly a tool of colonisation. So another tool of colonisation is capitalism, rape, you know, um, displacement. Um, having control of educating their children, because as Malcolm X says, only a fool would let his enemy teach his children. So that's why, again, it's so important for someone like me, who has grown up with all this history and is working on reiterating it through my poetry, because I can spend hours and hours and hours and weeks and weeks and weeks creating something, but if I can encapsulate that in a two minute poem, I've got people. And Gary Foley talks about how efficient that was when he started dabbling with theatre. He talks about that effect and being able to make people drop their guard and to be able to touch their emotions. And again, you know, this is, this is what we're all, always trying to do is unpack all this stuff and to humanise our stories because we've been dehumanised in order to justify all of these things. Um, yeah. when, when, people, when people sort of look at the of the Black Theatre, they don't realise that what came out of the Black Theatre was nose. What came out of nose was what... Uh, it's so respectable to everybody's Bangara. Now, if it wasn't for the Black Theatre, they wouldn't exist. Sometimes I get a bit cranky at these people for not acknowledging where the genesis was. Yeah, the whole Black Arts built on it. But everything, I mean, you, everything you look at around Black Arts but, uh, in this country, there was virtually nothing before that. Nothing. All the art revolutions are all Aboriginal. When we look at music, we look at yeah. Aboriginal, we look at Australian rock, we talk about Aboriginal rock. When we talk about art revolutions in this country, we're talking about Aboriginal art revolutions coming from Papania, coming from Eora, you know, these are all things that you know, are very And if you look at the percentage, you know, if you look at the percentages them, as writers, we have more percentages of writers per population than we do, but we, we're not we're not getting the we're not getting the national acclaim that happens. I, I've been nominated for how many awards now? Eleven. <laughs> I, I haven't won one yet. I haven't won one. I actually got into the finals for uh, a painting I did, New South Wales Aboriginal Artist Finals a few years ago. I walked in and they introduced the panel and, uh, and the, the people who give you the prize. No, made up of politicians and executives from mining companies. I said to Cheryl, well, there you go, I'm out the door. And sure enough, I was out the door. But I, I'm going to finish my talk with a poem because that's... Yeah, we've got 10 minutes. Yeah, so I'll just... Because it might have some questions. But Please do. I just... Um, change glasses. Um, otherwise I won't see, but... Uh, when we did this film, we did one about um, how I felt isolation. Mm -hmm coming out of jail when a lot of my brothers were uh, killed inside jail. There's a moving scene in the play, 49 days a week, where a man is listening to his best friend being beat to death. And later on, somebody came up to him and said, how on earth did you imagine that? So I didn't imagine it, I listened to it. 
and was, was a very close brother of Sherbert, in a cell two up from me, and I listened while they beat him to death all night long. And so did the rest of us. The next day, white prisoners were down in the yard. We weren't allowed out. And they were allowed us out for days and days on end. So they knew we would burn the joint of the jail. Well, you know, this is more about how they didn't win. Um, instead of captured, I call them uncaptured. You branded me a number. You flogged, tortured, and tried and tried to culturally alienate me. Cages, battens, underground tombs of death to decay the soul. Scar tissue, physical and mental, is your justice. Year in, year out, until violence is a norm. Hysterical laughter of supposed victory of my oppression. My spirit soars, the old one strengthened my will to survive your barbarism. Time grinds, eternity release. You crush my body, but my spirit outlives your strange ways. I walk and walk and walk to freedom while you die in your bile of violence. That's my answer to the people who brutalised me. I guess I want to say thank you so much, Lorna and Uncle Ken, for sharing and talking about this deep, mm -hmm. heavy history that I know that impacts us forever, always. Um, and I think when Lorna said it's about giving back, and um, I'm not originally from Sydney, I'm from the Northern Territory, and so this is my sort of small attempt at trying to give back by giving a space to these photos. Um, because I grew up knowing about these people, but never having this sort of this many images of these people. Like you know, and when I say these people, it's your families, it's you. <laughs> like, um, and the movement and the fight and the black power that came out of the Redfern Waterloo communities helped the country. Like you know, the legal service model went up to Darwin, and that's where my grandma started working. Um, so it's so close so, to my heart, even though <laughs> geographically it's so far. Um, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to mention Arnie over here, who was very instrumental in bringing mm. the services out to Western Sydney as well. Very you know, nice. um, so it's always important to just always. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, that's my that's my best friend, and that's <laughs> her mum. Yeah. yeah. So. But there's funny times. There's funny times. So <laughs> my cousin brother Sam Watson, um, Arnie Moran used to be on the streets when we were kids up in Brisbane, and we always laughed because. When we turned 18, he went to study law and I went to jail. <laughs> we, we, we always laughed about the different roads of activism, you know, it's mm. because we were kids and we were wild. Sammy was pretty wild, he seems respectful, but he was pretty wild in the jail. But, um, you know, 18, he goes up to... The funny thing was, when I actually went to uni myself, and I was on parole, I, he's the only one I knew in the family that had been, so I wrote him this letter of help. And he wrote back this... Major, major story. And it was about who was going out with who, what was happening in the political movement in Brisbane, um, everything about every family group that we knew. And the last line said, Oh, about university, you'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, it's the wisest thing he ever said to me be because right. he knew in his own heart. When I went back up to Brisbane, he said, I just put that on because I knew you could do it. And I didn't have anything to do. What could I tell you? And I thought, yeah. And so it was the smartest thing he wrote. And he just said, at the university, you'll be all right. Yeah, that's the same thing he said to all of us. But you know what? I want to say thank you for inviting me as well. Yeah. Because, um, you know, being uh, the child of two very politically active people and two big families that have been very politically active, um, you know, for a very, very, very long time. Um, you know, it's actually been a part of that transition now for my mum to start pushing me. Yeah. Um, and she and my mum and my dad have been doing that for a very long time. And they'll sit there and they'll, she'll say, you know, I don't even need to talk anymore because I just sit back and listen and you talk, you list everything that I would talk about and you add your own spin on it and you bring it into the now, you know. Yeah. And for me, that's like, you know, another part of that, of, of my journey 
that's like coming into you know adulthood yeah i'm 30 and i'm only starting to come into that adulthood now because there's been a push from my elders to you know get up and talk because they don't want to spend time wasting or waiting for people to understand the importance of this so that's why it's always there's always been a push from my elders and you know i'm scared to death of public speaking but i had to get over that really yeah. quickly you know um and i just wanted to thank you for inviting me as well because you know i was i wanted to bring mum along but you know yeah. she's actually ready to just like you know i'll look after no, your baby a privilege. and i know that yeah you carry her legacy so it's that's what we're doing i was, uh, i got a granddaughter who's 13 her time's a long way off yet yeah, but already they call her little kenna everybody they call her little kenna and thank you for holding on to these images for yeah. some reason. Thank you, Elaine. And, and, and thank you for all, not only these images, but even Yeah, that's the thing. This is, so much. this is one box, and, and so, so I know there's gaps, you know. Your grandmother's only being sunglasses. Like, I just I, think it says a lot. I love that. Yeah, but yeah, that's what I found with this. You've got these huge crowd shots, but you know that there's so many individuals in them that are just. So powerful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I guess if anyone wants to chat. Can, can I just say something? Um, I'm just speaking on behalf of me, but I think I'm speaking on behalf of everybody. Is that okay? Yeah. Just thank you. Say. <laughs> thank, it depends what exactly. Just want to thank you so much for, for this whole journey. Thank you, Carrie. Carrie is from Chambly Aboriginal College. I'm a graduate. White, a white fellow one. <laughs> um, we used to work there. And also for you creating this beautiful um, yeah. and important image. And to you both for your really important and honest contribution. Can I just run two things by you? Um, my understanding is that Pemawoy was killed and decapitated by Henry Hacking, mm. who was the quartermaster and a violent man. He was supposed to be blind as well, apparently. Didn't hear that bit. He was supposed to be half blind, apparently. He was um, on, on the Sirius, on the First Fleet. And the second thing that I understand is that smallpox actually first started where I live, in Camaragal country on the lower North Shore. Did you find that? Well, yeah, we found... Um, we found that, uh, yeah, that was one of the first recorded things, but then it quickly spread yeah. all over. No, it did, but I mean, that's yeah. where I, I believe and that, that was one that's of the where first, it was released. first places where yeah. it was released. But yeah. then all around the Sydney uh, Basin, all the plan groups, um, a little bit more than 70% died of smallpox. So this is when they start talking about numbers. Yeah. Before they could even get a handle on they killed almost three quarters of the people through. But the other tragic thing about smallpox, when you look at this country, our traditional way was we were divided by trade routes. Now one thing I read, <coughs> I had a look by a journal of a non-Aboriginal company, who was one of the first fellows to go to a place that's now called Albany in WA. And he, made friends with the locals there and they talked about this thing that killed all these people. Years before white people went there, all these people died of smallpox. And we found these narratives all over the country. In Albany? In Albany, WA, yeah, yeah, yeah. killed people with smallpox three decades before white people got there. But the trade routes went right up the Northern Territory. The smallpox and diseases went along the trade routes. So people were dead before these lost white people who had to be shown across the um, Blue Mountains because they couldn't find their way. Uh, we used to call the explorers lost white people. And it's like Burke and Wills, they were lost. They didn't discover anything, they were lost. That's why they died, because they were lost. Um, but in all those areas, disease killed people, decimated people. And if you, but you know, you look at more modern history, Alexander Downs, grandfather was um, Premier of South Australia and he sent an expedition of troopers up through the centre, right up through Northern Territory to kill every Aboriginal person in sight. That's Downer's grandfather. Imagine Downer sitting on his knee, what sort of stories he was telling him. Mm -hmm. no 
wonder the bloke turned up in Parliament House wearing fishnet stockings. Yes. No. I'm sorry, but what about Rand's granddaughter? Who? <laughs> And Redfern famously just helped, you know, murder someone and, and yeah. get very minimum time. Who is that? We've got um, Never ran store. Never ran granddaughter. Yeah. Daughter daughter daughter. Daughter. Mm, Never wrong. What happened? Huh? Well, it's a sign over there that says Rand give us our land. Yeah. yeah. And Never Rand was a what was premier? he governor a, a premier? He's a premier. His granddaughter ended up being a junkie and a bathing and helping um, and murder getting away right. with a m murder, literally. Um, you know, in Redfern. Oh, so I just find it all interesting how yeah. all these things. Two years. Yeah, it's right. Two years. Yeah. 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 Well, okay. And we called Never Ran, Never Wrong. <laughs> never Ran was called Never Wrong. And I would like to say something. I would, I would like to acknowledge that we're on Aboriginal land and gathered with people. I would like to acknowledge the elders past and present and remember that we're all on Aboriginal land everywhere you are. And I just want to give um, this to you, Ken. Thank you for making the film that we didn't show, but we'll put it on to uh, YouTube. Mm -hmm. And um, this is for you, Laura. Okay. And mm -hmm. I also have another present for you coming oh, yeah. from, <laughs> from, the, from the poetry. Thank night, you. Which is nicer than that. Yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> and this is for um, <coughs> Rebecca, the big one. Oh, thank you. So let's all clap. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 